just something I'd ever experienced before. It was so much fun sitting around and being together. And and so that that was our first introduction mm. to that intergenerational ministry that um, people were a family in that context. And we got thinking about our context in the cities and asked the question, you know, the Bible says that we are a family, that, that God is our father and that we're reconciled to him through Christ and that we are brothers and sisters and we are reconciled to each other through Christ. But we saw Aboriginal brothers and sisters in their church living that out and we, I suppose, learn how to do that too. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Shock Absorber podcast. It's very exciting to have you with us and I'm very excited to have two guests with me today. It's uh, my usual co-host, Stu Corshaw. How are you? Hello, Joel. It's exciting to have you back on the podcast yes. and you've had an exciting week. Yes. You've been at a PhD. <laughs> Not quite. No, a just hormone. a paper. Just a paper, yeah. <laughs> I like that though. I like the sound of you submitted a PhD. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe in the future, hopefully. Yeah. That's, no, that's the exciting. paper I pers- per, uh, submitted for my PhD research last night was exciting though because I got to... Um, uh, talk with some of my peers and and uh, some of the members of the staff of Sydney College of Divinity. Little shout out to SCD where I study my PhD, and uh, I presented uh, my ethical considerations. And I'm just about ready to start my uh, interviews for my PhD. So and my research so uh, stage. So I was uh, excited to do that last night, and the paper was fun. Yeah. Fantastic. And did you have a good reaction to intergenerational ministry that you were yeah, well presenting the, on? Yeah, well, the PhD's on shock absorber, uh, the shock absorber idea and in intergenerational ministry, which is obviously what we talk about on the podcast. And mm. yeah, people uh, found that really good. And some of the people were saying they might come along to the conference in ah, October too, yes, which was really good. That's good. We can actually promote that now. We can, don't we? Yeah, uh, yeah. The shock absorber uh, conference, guys, is on the 30th of October. This month is coming up. You can register for that on shockabsorber.com.au. So it's mm. right there on the main page. You can just click the link. So check that out. If you're interested in talking more about intergenerational ministry and what we talk about here on the shock absorber podcast, Having said that, I should introduce our next guest. <laughs> it's Jai. You've been on the podcast before, but it's your second appearance. Yes. Um, hello. Hello. How, how, how are you? you? Good. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Um, thanks you're man. very well versed in the shock absorber method or approach, as we like to talk about it, because um, you were part of the youth community at Guy uh, yep. You were a leader there um, yeah. and also a youth minister there. And then you took a break or went to went to a, a different church, and now yep. you're back here at Soul Revival Church. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You're the um, main leader of our Yarrawarra and Cronulla gatherings. Yeah, yeah. I look after uh, our two off-site campuses and uh, kind of oversee our church planning stuff. Yeah, fantastic. And so you've been involved in youth ministry a lot, and that's one of the things we're talking about today is uh, engaging youth in the church. Yeah. And we're going to talk about Aboriginal youth ministry yes. um, this episode. Um, Stu, but before we start, we might as well do our cultural artefact, which we mm. always like to do. Do you want to hit us up with that? Yeah, well, um, as Joel said, we're going to talk about Aboriginal youth ministry today because we're up to the 2010s in our story. We've been travelling through the decades of uh, different approaches that people have used to engage with youth. And today we're going to look at uh, some of the Aboriginal ministries to Aboriginal youth in Australia. And I thought that maybe a good cultural artefact to look at today, considering that we're looking at this topic, is a classic Australian movie called Rabbit Proof Fence, which came out in 2002, and it was directed by Philip Noyce. And it's the story, uh, it's set in 1931, and it's the story of three Aboriginal girls who escape after being plucked from their homes to be trained as domestic staff. And these girls are part of the stolen generation. In, it's set in Western Australia okay. and they're at home with their, their mother and the police come in a car. It's quite a dramatic scene actually as the girls are forcibly dragged into the car, taken away from their mother. It's terribly sad. Mm. And they're driven away from their home. And many, many young Aboriginal children were taken from their families right up until the late 1970s in Australia. And so for people who aren't aware of the stolen generation and the issues around that and the need for reconciliation, it's a really good movie just to understand that some uh, very um, very important issues need to be still sorted through and worked on in our, in our country today. And reconciliation is a really big issue. Uh, one of those but anyway in the movie the the girls go to this school and they're thrown in with all these other children that they don't know and two of the girls decide they're going to escape and they're going to get back to their mum it's a really fantastic adventure because the way they get back home and the name of the movie is in between the states of south australia 
and Northern Territory and Western Australia, there's this huge fence. And the reason they built this fence was because the rabbit problem in Australia had spread right across South Australia. And, and so that the South Australia uh, problem didn't go into Western Australia, they built this long fence called the Rabbit Proof Fence to stop rabbits going into Western Australia. And these girls know that this fence... Uh, goes all the way to their home. So even though they're hundreds of kilometres away from their their mother, they go to the fence and then they travel along the fence and they have this epic journey through the desert. It's amazing. Mm. So it's a terrific, terrific movie. And, um, yeah, really worth watching. So um, yeah, it's very moving but also very inspiring. That's really cool. Um, and when we started getting um, chatting to our brothers, our, our Indigenous brothers and sisters, um, that was with Isaac, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So we... Uh, we, we've been friends with um, an Aboriginal pastor, Isaac, and his wife, Eileen, since the early 2000s. And he's come up and in a few different podcasts already. Yeah, yeah, and just being friends with them has been terrific. And we've we've actually been able to go on a great journey with um, our brothers and sisters in Brewarrina, and Isaac's introduced us to other ministries around New South Wales, including introducing us to the slabs up in Fingal Head. And today we're actually going to look at some of the ministries that Isaac and his family have started in Brewarrina, out in western New South Wales, and also some of the youth ministry that the slabs have started up in Fingal Head during the 2010s. Yeah, yeah fantastic. So, um, Joy, I don't know, do you remember the first time that... Um, you met up with Isaac? Uh, yeah, I remember the first time I met up with Isaac, but I guess the, um, the it all kind of started when Fee uh, Francesconi was um, the uh, scripture teacher at Gaimi High, mm. and Douglas, uh, one of uh, Isaac's uh, boys, uh, was, I can't remember what year at school he was in, but uh, Fee had him for scripture, I think we were in year seven, year eight, somewhere around there, and and, and Dougie brought in a, a Bible and... Um, and Fee got chatting with him, and, and Doug said, "Oh, do you want to do you want to chat to my my dad, uh, to my parents?" And uh, and Fee thought that would be a great idea. Uh, called up Stu, and then I think you guys got Went in around contact. that afternoon. Yeah, 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 because yeah. they were house parents at uh, Kiranari up the yep. up the road, which is an Aboriginal hostel in yeah. Sylvania in the Sutherland Shire. Yeah, yeah, and then you guys went over and. Yeah, we hung out. So uh, Fiona was a youth minister at Guy Anglican Church with Joy and I, and she was teaching scripture at Guy like Joy was saying. And basically after school, she just rang and said, oh, I just met this really cool kid. And uh, the thing that was different about Doug is that he brought a Bible along to scripture, and she wasn't used to kids at Guy and High <laughs> bringing right. Bibles. Yeah, yeah. I, I think she taught you too, Joel, didn't she? Yep, at, she did. Did you ever bring a Bible to scripture, Joel? Uh, nope. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> so it was actually quite delightful for her to see a, a young teenager having a Bible in class. And Douglas had brought his Bible and opened it up. And so that's why Fee went over and had a chat with him. And he said, Oh, you know, maybe come around and visit the family. So, yeah. So, like I said, I just jumped in the car. And we went around, visited Kirinari, and knocked on the door. And Ike and Eileen gave us a uh, cup of tea. And, and we just became really good friends from there. And so for a while there, they joined our church at Guy Anglican Church. And used to bring a lot of the kids at Kirinari along. The Kirinari Aboriginal Hostel of Sylvania is set up so that kids who uh, live in the bush who want to come to the city to study can stay there and go predominantly to uh, there's a, the Endeavour Sports High in, in Southern Shire and also Guimi High, uh, which are two schools uh, around our area, for those that aren't from around the area here, but we're in southern Sydney. Anyway, so the city life for Ike in Ireland wasn't exactly ideal. They right. they really missed home. So eventually they moved back to Brewarrina. Mm. And, um, but the funny thing was that even though we were, you know, having great fellowship at church with Isaac Eileen and their family and some of the kids from Kirinari, Ike uh, said to me one day, you've got to come up to Brewarrina and meet meet my family and come and see what, you, you know, meet the town up there. And I hadn't actually heard of Brewarrina until Ike said that. And so... Uh, Lou and I and my son Ethan, who at that stage was only, yeah, well, Elijah, my second son, hadn't come around, so he was under five years old. Right. We, we jumped in this uh, this little beetle that we had and we drove all the way up to... Another um, V-dub. It sure. was a V-dub, <laughs> yes, Joel. And we drove all the way up to Brewarren, and it was 10 hours away, 10, 10 and a bit actually, so north western New South Wales and it was so exciting the first time we went out there because we'd never been to Brewarrina before but as soon as we pulled up outside of Isaac's mum's place uh, where he organised for us to meet um, everybody just said oh come and come and have a cup of tea and mm -hmm. straight away we were just really impressed with how beautiful their family and their community was so that's how we met Isaac and Eileen and, and over time 
uh, you know, issues like the stolen generation were in the back of my mind. And I remember sitting down with a cup of tea with Isaac one day and just saying, Isaac, I'm just so sorry for all the all the stuff that my people have done to your people in the past. And Isaac um, shared with me uh, something that he'd been thinking through, which he calls the black and white handshake. Mm -hmm. And he said, brother, he said, the thing is that Jesus has paid for sin and we are reconciled to one another through Christ and what he's done. And because you're a Christian and I'm a Christian, we're actually brothers. And he, and he, he really just blew me away with that. And, he said, you know, we are brothers and Jesus has reconciled us and what we need to do is express that and express that reconciliation. And that's why he had that black and white handshake that in Christ we can come together. So uh, I said to him that day, you know, what are some of the things we can do to come together? And he said, well, uh, my people in the past used to have robbery at, at um, Brewarna. There's a massive fish trap at Brewarna that actually is a huge... Um, fish trap made out of stones that are in the river and yeah. it's still there in Brewarana mm. and it was, uh, some archaeologists have said it's actually predated the pyramids. That's how old well. the, the structures are there in Brewarana. But it's a place where the Niambar and Wurigi and other, other tribal groups came together for corroboree, which is not only dancing and partying basically, but also to do business and to do law. And he said uh, before uh, the British came to Australia, uh, they used to to meet there and it was a massive deal thousands of people would come together at that and then uh he told me the story after that that um what happened was um the aboriginal people were taken from their lands and then they were put onto missions and so that was the end of those big meetings and corroborees and instead uh place towns like brewarana had missions placed on them there was one at dubbo there was one at moree they were around uh, and, and Aboriginal people weren't allowed to live in the towns with everyone. And so they had to live in these missions. And basically, um, Isaac told me uh, the story about his wife Eileen's uh, grandmother, who was actually taken from Angledu to Brewarana. And we got to meet um, Eileen Peters. And she um, was a beautiful uh, matriarch of the of the community out there and, and Nan Peters as she um, was known out there and also allowed us to call her Nan Peters too which was mm. very special mm. became really good friends with us mm. didn't she Joy yeah, yeah. she told us her story about how she was taken with her whole tribe from Angledu from their their river and one night the way it happened was just dreadful it was around uh, a little bit after the 1931 story of the rabbit proof fence but it was a similar kind of time um her family were living traditionally um, on the river and one night in the middle of the night the government came with trucks, big cattle trucks, and got all the people in the tribe to stand in the back of these trucks, men, women and children, and then drove them into the night, took them away from their home and forcibly put them on the mission at Brewarana. But on the mission at Brewarana, Eileen uh, Nan Peters tells the story that um, she wasn't allowed to speak a language, they weren't allowed to sing anymore and it was just a really, really sad time. Mm. But in the midst of that, she said it, the, the one thing that gave her hope was that she heard the gospel about Jesus and she decided as a really young little girl that she'd become a Christian in the Sunday school there. And some of her uh, Aboriginal friends teased her because they said, you, you know, we, we don't think you should become a Christian because that's what these white people are and look what they've done to us. Mm -hmm. But she, through all the pain and sadness of, of the being taken to the mission, she was able to to hear the love of Jesus and, and the reconciliation that he could give. And so uh, she held on to that hope. Um, Nan was also trained up to become domestic staff and she was sent to uh, a farm. And she she's uh, maybe another a day we might even talk to uh, Ike or Eileen, see if they could come on the podcast, tell Nan's story. Mm. We've also got some of her story on mm. video too. She shared that with us. Mm. And Joy in a minute might want to share some of that too. But we'd, we'd basically met... Uh, Nan Peters and she shared with us that past but again like Isaac she said we're now reconciled because of Christ and so she was really in influential in forming up the Christian ministry uh, and keeping the gospel going amongst Aboriginal people with others including Ike's dad uh, who was a, a itinerant preacher and as 
they did their ministry uh, in the early days, they used to have not corroboree, but they had river conventions. So instead of having a corroboree, they'd all gather together the Christians from northwestern New South Wales and get everyone together for a river convention. And they'd get together and they'd sing songs and tell testimonies and tell stories and preach the gospel. Mm. And people would become Christians. But then over time, that had ceased uh, for, I think, maybe even 15, 20 years. Mm. So that back in the early 2000s, when Ike said, you know, and I were talking about how we can express this reconciliation, his idea was, why don't we start the River Conventions again? And I was really excited about that, to be invited to be a part of that. And I said, only if we can come in under your leadership, like, we'd love to help. And he said, why don't you bring a mob from Sydney and come up to Brewarrina and we can have a River Convention at Brewarrina again and get it going again where it used to be. And so, didn't we, Joy? We got yeah, up yeah. and maybe Joy could tell that story. We came up, Nan Peters was there and she was probably in her... 70s or 80s by the time we met her and she passed away about 10 years ago and we don't know exactly how old she was <laughs> she didn't know how old she mm. was exactly but right. she was we think in the mid to late 90s by the time she passed away but we'd get together for the river convention and you came too eh? Do you yeah remember yeah that? yeah it was great we uh going up and uh camping by the barwon river um you know doing open air uh, in town as well as by the river, uh, Ike sharing the word of God, and I still remember him talking about how we are we are all of the same blood. We're washed mm. by the same blood of Christ, mm. uh, and that was uh, that, that it was it was amazing to hear that, and um, it really uh, it was it impacted me greatly. Um, and just the, the relationships and the way that they they opened their community to us and welcomed us in was it was amazing and it was it was all about being friends with one another um, and being friends in Christ that was what we had in common and it was amazing it was really cool yeah and that was cool hey because we used to talk about friendship visits we'd go up on a friendship visit mm. and that that first river convention worked so well on that long weekend at Easter that Ike started river conventions all over New South Wales, again, like they used to, in Colleen O'Brien, in Dubbo, in uh, Gilgandra, mm. uh, all over the place. So every long weekend during the year, uh, we'd, we'd go up. To, I, I was going up five times a year. Jai was coming up pretty often yeah. as well. <laughs> and it was just so much fun to, yeah. to oh. spend a holiday up in, on a river convention. Yeah, yeah, and even at one point, Ike said, hey, you guys should run one. And we did one down <laughs> at uh, Bundina, I remember one year. Yeah. That, you know, it was just... Yeah, it was, it was it was it was really cool. How many yeah. do you reckon you've been to? Oh, I don't know, lots and lots <laughs> and lots. Yeah, I don't know, yeah. it's heaps. But but one of the funny things about that comment and Jai's comment about the um the the river convention down in Sydney is we did it down on the the Hacking River down at Bundina, as Jai said. But it was on Australia Day, yeah. and it was really funny because there was all these people walking around with Australian flags on and Yahoo and stuff, and 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 they were just walking past us, and then they'd stop because we had this massive big. Uh, poster, I think yeah, you yeah. got printed actually yeah, yeah, with, yeah. with the black and white handshake on it, and oh. that just sort of like, and it was really interesting because he, you know, in Australia Day is still quite a, um, a big issue. It's contentious mm. today, yeah. but in the midst of this contentious issue, where some people were on that day, uh, you know, demonstrating a, a, about changing the date of Australia Day uh, for very good reasons, but also people who were just celebrating Australia Day. Here we were sharing around the, the gospel and being together around Jesus and I think in the River Convention there was about two or three hundred people who'd mm. come from all over New South Wales to come down to Sydney so here we were white white and uh, and Aboriginal Australians together uh, in in the name of Jesus on that day so I thought that was really beautiful. Um, should we just explain to the listeners and, and viewers uh, what what usually happens at a River Convention? Yeah well Jai you <laughs> mentioned the open air I think yeah. one of the funny parts. And everything. Yeah like uh, we, we're from the city so in the city we're used to church that's very structured and short and so we're used to going to church and most of us probably consume church really like we sit there we sing some songs and pray but we don't get up the front but the great thing about a river convention and an open air they call it is instead of doing all the gatherings inside they take at least one of them out into the park and set up a big PA and Isaac basically sets up this really loud <laughs> speaker system and even though some most of the people are in their houses some people come out and have a listen but he just then like has this terrific uh they sing song christian songs and sing hymns and and people get up and tell testimony so the christians who are sitting in the park um ike will be on the speaker and he'll like i remember the first one at brewer and it was all dark and the houses were all there and there's only a few people in the park you know a few people had come but ike stood really confident at the mic and said come on my brothers and sisters we come to tell you about how much jesus loves you and he, he was literally like <laughs> 
preaching to people in their houses. Yeah, yeah. And I, I reckon there were people like getting a cup of tea and sitting on the oh, we better come out. next to the window. Yeah. No, I think they actually just sat in their houses and listened. Oh, yeah. It was really cool. Some model. people came out some and maybe people. onto their front porch or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and some people came to the park. But then what was really fun was, you know, this group from Sydney and the, the first river convention, we had about 60 of us came up to Brewarina and he'd get people up one by one he'd say oh brother Jai come up and share and you'd be like and, and you but he, just call, he doesn't doesn't he just call on people yeah, yeah, yeah he yeah, doesn't yeah. give no, you any no, warning. Yeah. He just says, <laughs> no warning and then he'll say to someone do you got a song for us and <laughs> and then Nan Peters would get up and sing this oh. beautiful song shall we gather at the river yeah, or, yeah. or one of the other beautiful songs that she'd sing she'd sing that um, almost every convention oh, just was, all the songs she sang were yeah. beautiful and um so everyone it wasn't about how good you were and how professional it was it was just about sharing, you mm. sharing. And you, and you might not have much to share, but it was actually lovely to listen to different people saying what Jesus means to them. And then he'd give a talk. So it'd go for hours, like two or three hours. And it was beautiful. And then afterwards, we'd all go around someone's house and have a big feed. And mm. there'd be curries and there'd be, you know, laughter. And, there'd and, be kids and running around. Kids running everywhere. And mm. I think we've said on earlier podcasts, they were actually the times where a penny dropped for us went, oh, we have meals at Soul Revival Youth Community but imagine if church was having a meal. And so the fact that we do church like we do at Soul Revival is, is basically because we've been influenced by those open airs and those river conventions, yeah. It's a very different way of doing church. It's very it? different, like, yeah. yeah. And a good way to learn, like, it can be done differently too. Yeah, exactly. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we talked about, we're actually going to talk about the, the, some, a few different youth ministries in the 2010s with our Aboriginal brothers and sisters. Um, how did they develop and, and how did um, our relationship with Isaac develop over that time? Well, as we said, hey, uh, Kieran Ari was kind of like Isaac, um, you know, doing doing ministry to young people, even though it was a secular uh, uh, place that he was in. He was. Uh, we've talked earlier in earlier podcasts about Chap Clark's missional approach, where we go to outside the bounds of the church to the community, and and um, we also talked last week about parachurch ministry and chaplaincy, where. Uh, it's it's uh, about coming in bes- alongside people. Mm. We've also talked about Andrew Root saying that uh, our concept of place sharing, where as Christians we need to be in the same place where uh, non-Christian youth are. And I think all of those theoretical constructs explain really well what what Isaac would, was doing uh, with the Kirinari. So he, he wouldn't be doing the open airs and preaching at the Kirinari. He did ask the kids if they wanted to come along to the youth group at Guy and and come along to church and some did, some didn't. But he was just, yeah, he was just there for them and caring for them and encouraging them. But then when it came back to um, Brewarina, what what we were seeing from about 2005 on, Hey Jai, was Mm. that it was very intergenerational in those early days. So the way they did youth ministry was as a family. Have you got any thoughts on that, Jai, about what you observed in in those times? Yeah, yeah, it was definitely, um, ministry wasn't, well, there was this ministry and this ministry. It was just ministry. Mm. It was just one whole thing. Like and all of life kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, it was an all of life thing. Um, I've got to, I can't help but think of every time I think of all of life, the, the Ted Lasso thing and the guy talking about football is all, all of life. Football, football is, is life. life. Yeah. Yeah. For those of you that don't know, that's an Apple TV <laughs> yeah. show. It's Sorry. very funny. Um, but yeah, but, but ministry was an all-encompassing thing. It, was, it wasn't uh, in certain compartments. It was just a we do ministry together and we share – our, our faith and what we're learning and we share the gospel with everybody um and it was it was for me I, at, at that point i actually hadn't been a christian for super long and so it was very uh eye-opening for me to see uh sharing faith and doing ministry in a, in a way uh, like this because it wasn't wasn't always how church did it um and so yeah so it was really fascinating and i had had wonderful conversations with Ike because after Kirinari uh, they moved into a place um, just down the road mm. uh, from there um, because one of their kids was playing for Cronulla Sharks yep. um, and I would just you, it was wonderful because like they said don't call just turn up and so I would mm. just turn up and have a cuppa and Ike would share and it would just be it was just he, he, I really learn a lot from him um, and I still do uh, about ministry and what it is to be a Christian and um, and yeah looking at ministry as a whole and not seeing it in sections was, was one of those things yeah. did, did that shape you as a leader in, in your ministry as well yeah I think so I think I think um, it, for me it made me made me think okay well what whatever um, you know 
at the time I was doing youth ministry and had leaders who were at university and things like that. I wasn't just focusing about what they were doing at uni or outside of uni. It was what's happening for them and their family and, and how, how is their life impacted by the gospel and sharing the gospel. Um, and then the kids that we were leading too, you know, thinking about how do we uh, help them and engage their parents as well and all those sorts of things. So, yeah, it helped to, to look much wider than um, just what was in front of me i guess are you, uh, that, that's interesting are you usually happy guys to have someone just drop in at your house and start chatting <laughs> well yeah i mean i suppose as youth ministers there's a bit of that but what what was great was that um when i first met ike uh, he, he brought a friend around felly one day he's become one of my really good friends as well and they rocked up at 10 30 i think to and my nine. place just knocked at the door and said oh, i want to have a cup i'm like yeah man come in oh. so i think as um city people we're very um i suppose we're very time poor and and we're we're also very task focused Mm. and we compartmentalize our lives into i do this here and i do that there but yeah as joe was saying community out in brewarner is a lot more relational less task focused Mm. and it's not time poor and so people who live in a town where the daily temperatures during the day can quite regularly go over 40 (laughs) degrees it's not (laughs) a heaps pleasant thing to go around to someone's house during the day so i think yeah people hang out and, and talk late into the night they call it yarning have, <laughs> have yarning and so yeah i've had regular chats around a fire or just around a cup of tea that can go to one in the morning or mm. whatever and, and that taught me to slow down and care for people i think mm. more some of the chats we had with nan peters uh you know after the river conventions we'd go back to someone's house for dinner but even after that we'd sit around talking you know all night like mm. late into the night so you know listening to her stories took time and it was good to listen but um a couple of weeks ago when we had uh, Dave Lovell from Christian Surfers on the podcast, he said that one of the things Brett was really keen for is to come alongside people. Uh, I suppose that is what was happening with us, with our Aboriginal brothers and sisters too, we were coming alongside each other. Mm. But actually more than that, we're probably coming underneath their leadership and trying to learn from them and yeah. wanting to learn about how to reconnect the generations, how to reconnect with people and be less focused on time and less focused on tasks Mm. and more focused on people so if the services went for two or three hours that was actually not a big deal on the river convention so Mm. but yeah watching the youth ministry aspect of that was really fascinating because i remember one day um uh, ethan my son was only six and he was playing uh, rugby league with the kids and and they're all throwing the ball around and and Ethan wasn't used to rugby league, and so he played soccer, and he was only little anyway. But yeah. anyway, he got he got a, a a bit of a you know a tackle and got tackled onto the ground by some of the boys as it was just part of the game. And I remember Felly saying coming over, and saying you you you're right nephew yeah. to Ethan, and Ethan's like looked up at him. He said, he said oh, I'm okay, Uncle Fell. I've just got a scratch on my arm, and then. And Philly just really gently said to the other kids, he said, just remember, Ethan comes from the city, but he's your cuz. And so then they were all saying, yeah, sorry, cuz, sorry, didn't mm. mean to hit you. They didn't, you know, mean to put him down hard. It was just Ethan wasn't used to it. So after that, I watched how they sort of went, oh, yeah, he does. He plays he plays the round ball game, not the <laughs> rugby league. So we're going to have to help him to learn how to play this a bit better. Another example of how beautiful that ministry to young people was in those contexts was... Uh, I got a chance to go on a river convention up at Maribra with Isaac and, and another friend of ours, um, uh, the, the Slabs. And I was sitting on the river bank with Kevin Slab and the kids were playing in the river just next to us and we were just watching them play in the river. And um, Ethan was in amongst all, all the uh, kids from this top end community and it, he was just playing and they were all just kids, you know. It didn't matter what colour skin they had or, or whatever, they were all just playing. But then as we were sitting on the river, we noticed that there was a snake swimming across the river Ooh. towards me and Kevin. And I said, oh, Kev, is that a snake? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, all oh, right. Um, and I'm looking at the kids and I'm looking at the <laughs> snake and it's coming straight for us. And I said, is that a brown snake? And he goes, nah, it's a taipan. I'm like, oh, that's even worse than a brown snake. <laughs> yeah. And he's just really loving this moment while I'm starting to freak out. And he, I said, well, what are we going to do? He goes, oh, it'll be all right. Anyway, the snake comes over and as soon as its head hit the side of the riverbank, in one movement, Kevin stands up, gets a stick, whacks the snake on the head, <laughs> kills it in one blow, and then tosses the snake into the kids who were swimming in the river in the middle, and all the kids are screaming, <laughs> yelling, and coming out of the water. So I wanted, I suppose I wanted to tell that story because just so many laughs in amongst all of that. It wasn't like just something I'd ever experienced before. It was so much fun 
sitting around and being together. And and so that that was our first introduction mm. to that intergenerational ministry that um, people were a family in that context. And we got thinking about our context in the cities and asked the question, you know, the Bible says that we are a family, that, that God is our father and that we're reconciled to him through Christ and that we are brothers and sisters and we are reconciled to each other through Christ. But we saw Aboriginal brothers and sisters in their church living that out and we, I suppose, learn how to do that too. That's really cool in helping to understand the early days about how the ministry started to develop and our relationship with those guys. It's just a really familial vibe. I really liked hearing those stories. Um, we got a little bit sidetracked, Bo, but uh, what about the, the youth, ministry, youth ministries that developed uh, throughout the 2010s? Yeah, so out of the River Conventions, I think there was um, a lot of really good things happen. Um, one of the River Conventions that used to take place uh, at Easter 2 was up at Finkelhead and that was more of a beach community than the river community out in northwestern New South Wales and I suppose during the 2000s they started uh, a youth ministry to um, Indigenous kids in the Finkelhead community uh, Joel Slab and, and Kyle Slab and some of the other uh, members of the family started that youth group there and then it, by 2010s um, Isaac had actually, as we said, moved back to Brewarrina and he actually worked with a group called Hands and Feet to buy a shop front and we've also got a bit involved with helping to get that set up. And so both uh, in Brewarrina and in Finkelhead, some really exciting th new things were happening. So in um, Brewarrina, Isaac, had, one of the other things that Isaac did was he was also a chaplain in the jails and so one of his passions was to help young Indigenous uh kids avoid avoid uh, jail time and there's um, really high incarceration rates amongst Aboriginal people in Australia which is a terribly sad story and something that is really needing a great deal of attention and Isaac thought he wanted to do something about that so he started something called the Josiah Healing Centre and the idea was to take young people from the town of Brewarrina and go camping with them uh, together with the youth leaders and uh, go camping on the riverbank and to sit around a fire and just tell their stories and heal through telling stories. And then he'd tell the story of Jesus as well and sh share how that story means so much to him. So that was a really exciting new development. And um, we uh, saw from that the beginning of a youth group. Now, um, Isaac's son, Douglas, and his daughter, uh, Julianne, both of them put together a really cool program on a Friday night for the young people in Brewarrina. And they ran this youth group in Brewarrina. They got a bus. They went around picking the kids up and they brought them to, to the, the hall. Uh, originally, before they had the shop front, they were meeting in a hall. And it was super popular. All these kids came. Mm. I remember one week I got invited to go and speak at the youth group and it was super fun mm. because as well as being a youth group, there were some, you know, some adults sitting around as well and people m making a meal. And, and it looked a little bit like a, a river convention, but a bit younger. Yeah. with the focus yeah. on teenagers but the really cool thing about that was that um there was about 70 kids going to that youth group and that that was a pretty high proportion of the high school in Brewarrina so there was a really big impact on the community of these kids coming to this youth group um the other good thing about that was that Douglas was using technology really in a clever way and so he was using uh the kids all had iPhones so he was encouraging them to download the U version uh, Bible app on the iPhones so it's a real Bible based program because what was happening is is encouraging the kids to read a verse every day and then share that mm. in on the on the U version app and I know other youth ministries use that but Douglas used that really well with his uh, Aboriginal youth group and they called that Aboriginal youth group the what up squad <laughs> and so as well as uh, coming on Friday night they're actually obviously uh, in the town together hanging out a lot and also using digital really in a really new clever way. So again, we learn a new thing and we started encouraging our youth leaders to do what Douglas was doing with the Uversion app and getting our youth leaders to also be interacting uh, with Uversion with the kids. So yeah, that was what was going on at Brewarrina in the 2010s with Douglas and, and Julianne. Mm -hmm. Did you get to experience any of that joy yourself? No, I, at, at that point I was uh, further down the coast, so I didn't yep. uh, I get to do uh, many trips during that time up to, to Bree, um, but heard lots of stories like that one and, and, uh, and other ones um, from Stu and from Mikey and from other people who went up. Mm. Yeah. And how did, um, did uh, 
like Isaac and Doug shared the impact that it might have had on the community were there people really um, engaged in it and really excited about well, it well I could tell a quick story just to talk about the impact stories are I, great I was on my way up to Brewarrina on one of my trips and I stopped off at Walgett for a coffee and I went into the coffee shop and there was a lady behind the counter and she said oh you know what can I get for you and I said I'll have a, a coffee please and she gave me a cappuccino and while she was making me a cappuccino she said um, oh where are you off to oh where are you from and I said oh I'm from Sydney and she's like oh where are you off to I said oh, I'm off to Brewarrina and then she paused and she said what's going on at Brewarrina mm. and I said what do you mean she said well it just seems like the town's coming alive there's so many people talking about all these positive things that are taking place there's so many young people uh, that seem to be uh, excited and, and really thriving and I thought that was a tremendous mm, example yeah. that that youth group was having an impact so much so that a lady who was in the coffee shop at Walgett which was a town about an hour and a half away were hearing about that great story and seeing seeing a lot of good fruit from it but yeah I think I think a lot of the a lot of the impact is going to be long term it's low key and it's relational so yeah. while you can point to things like yeah there were 70 kids going to the youth group and um, that's really exciting there's also you know just this this reconfiguration of um, all these young people's lives and and I think that's a really and exciting the town, thing are you talking about well yeah the town's being impacted they've, yeah. they've also gone from there to start a men's Bible study and a women's Bible study yeah. and the church is having services in the church now and um, uh, another funny story uh, a few of us went up to I mean just before lockdown we got to go up to Christmas carols and Ike asked me if I'd speak at the Christmas carol so I went up there and um, and there was of all things a tornado and a storm hit <laughs> and so here we were in the park with with a truck and with the PAs and stuff there's about 100 people in this particular one and this big tornado came and it was like a whirly whirly a big sandstorm coming coming over the top and there was there was like sparks coming off the wires and everyone ran and the wind blew and it was and it was really funny because my son Elijah who's um, 16 at the time they asked him if he'd be Santa Claus. So he was in the police station dressed up as Santa Claus. And um, he's the skinniest Santa Claus I'd ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> very yeah. funny. But anyway, the, stand, the sandstorm hit and poor Elijah was going to come with the police and Elijah were going to come bring all these presents for the kids. Uh, Douglas had organised because Douglas was a police liaison officer. And Doug worked with the police and they decided they'd get all these toys for the kids and bring them. So obviously Elijah and the police are waiting for the big reveal of Santa Claus coming to this big carol <laughs> service and the storm hit. Mm. I remember my mate Jason Bakuya was cooking sausages on the barbecue when the storm just hit and literally sausages were being blown off the barbecue. Wow, that's <laughs> a strong wind. Yeah, he's yeah. still turning. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> some of our listeners might have heard of Bujara. He's um, one of the slabs mm. from Fingal Head and he was, he's now got... Um, uh, a growing music career he's on triple j and mm, yeah. releasing albums but anyway he was on stage playing a song as the storm hit and i remember butch going oh i think we might finish there because um there's a bit of a wind coming and as he said it the drum kick flew off the stage so it was very funny so we're all running for cover and i said to some people we should go we should go and get elijah he's in the police station he doesn't know what's going on so i drove to the police station in the wind and it was all crazy there was tele, tele uh, you know, the, the wires Electric, were coming electrical down, wires. electrical yeah. wires were sparking and stuff, yeah. lights going off. And I ran into the police station and the, and the two policemen, they were fairly young police officers, and Elijah, and, and um, there's Elijah dressed up as Santa Claus behind the police desk. It was the funniest thing. <laughs> looked like he'd been arrested. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, no, it looked like he was on the counter being a policeman. It's like, oh, yes, how can I help you? I'm Santa Claus. Yeah. And he's this 60-year-old kid anyway. Yeah. He's like looking at me blankly, and I'm like, oh, there's a storm. And the police go, oh. I suppose we should go out and check and see if everyone's all right. You guys will be all right in here, eh? And I'm like, yeah, no, I don't think we'll stay in the police station by ourselves. We might, we might head to. And he's like, yeah, fair enough. So everyone was really casual about it. So here's Elijah dressed up as Santa and he's got this big pillow down his stomach with the... Yeah, it was very funny. Anyway, afterwards, when the storm had gone, we all went back to the church and all the lights were out and the air conditioner was off and it was all dark. And we just sat in the dark and with, you know, just the emergency lighting and just sang Christian hymns. And Elijah turned to me and he said, this has been one of the greatest experiences, um, you know, being embraced by the community, getting to know friends. And I think what's great about that model of youth ministry is it's about relationship with Jesus means that we have relationship with each other. And so getting to know each other and becoming friends is, mm. is a really special thing. Um, I'm really excited that my son's getting married in January and he and his uh, fiance Katie said, "Oh, we we're really excited about uh, the wedding, blah blah." And they're getting all the invitations, and and Ethan just said to me, "Oh, do you, 
do you reckon you could get Isaac and Eileen and Felly's address because I'd love to invite them to my wedding? Mm. And it was just, yeah, sure. And rang Ike and got Felly and Ike's address and just the post office box and that. And said, so it's all, it's all become in our family just uh, we're really connected with our brothers and sisters out west. Mm. And, and um, I think family. that, re- yeah, I think that relationship, the reconciliation Ike and I talked about early in the 2000s, Ike was right. We are brothers and sisters mm. and we are family that here's my son, Ethan, that was, you know, Feli was saying, what's wrong, nephew, you know, when he's yeah. in the dirt. Now Feli will be mm. at Ethan's wedding and it's a really beautiful mm. long-term story which we'll continue to tell. But one other thing I'd like to just share briefly is uh, not only has the Brewarina Youth Ministry formed up more and more, um, but also in Fingal Head, Joel and uh, Mary Slab, who are who who Budger is mum and dad actually, uh, they've started a, a, a an enterprise called Jurakai Surf Skate uh, and Culture uh, Enterprise, and that idea is to start encouraging Indigenous youth in surfing and skating, and they run these big um, events, and they've been getting more and more popular. They've got surf. Indigenous surfers from right across Australia and now from the Pacific and from New Zealand coming to these Jurakai events. Uh, they got sponsorship by Air Asia for them and that's another great example of an Aboriginal youth ministry that's now growing through the, the, the 2010s. Obviously it's been on hold through COVID but Mary and Joel have again taken on that same, similar kind of Chap Clark missional approach that uh, Christian surfers have, mm. but have focused in on Indigenous youth and Aboriginal youth. And that's also had a, a really big impact in up the coast. Um, our church has a caravan that, that Joy and I put together. Joy, you hey, tow, Joy, tow it everywhere. That we tow everywhere. <laughs> but we took the caravan up. Fun. Uh, Joel said, oh, bring the caravan up with a coffee machine and we'll chuck that in. And they have like a little festival. And we set it up with all these other people and we just sell coffee and hang out. And again, there's this low-key, long-term relational vibe that, over years of doing things together here and there, we've become very close mm. um, as well. And Joel's brother, Kyle, taught me a terrific message about that that I wanted to share today, which is um, that in in the Budger, uh, sorry, in the Budgelung culture, because um, the slabs are part of the Bunjalung uh, mob, in Bunjalung uh, they have a word for the younger brother, and the younger brother is Bunam. And the idea of the younger brother in their culture is that the bun arm, the younger brother, needs to actually be strong for the older brother to help the older brother. And the older brother needs to be strong for the younger brother. And um, one day um, when Kyle taught me that, he said, you know, that's kind of like us, bro. He said, you, you guys are kind of bun arm to us. You know, we, we were here first, so we're the older brother. But you're the younger brother and we can actually have uh, a relationship with each other that is about being brothers. So I think, I think that's the, the, f- the kind of vibe we've learnt from the Aboriginal Youth Ministry. It's not about mm. programs and events. It's about Aboriginal Youth Ministry is about being an intergenerational family that is actually passing on the story to the next generation and raising them up, the younger brothers and sisters, to, um, to actually be strong for the older brothers and sisters and seeing how Aboriginal people respect their elders and love their elders has also taught us a lot about as younger generations of city people that we need to we need to be more proactive about not only passing on the gospel to young people but doing it together with our older generations and seeing the fruit from that. Mm. I think that's um, really cool. I, I was just going to, you've, you've just done it there a little bit. I thought we could, as we always do at the end of every episode, sort of reflect on how this influences the shock absorber and how what we think about it. Joy, I was going to ask you, like, mm. what what have you learnt from our, our long-term and low-key relationship with our brothers and sisters um, out west and up north um, in terms of doing intergenerational ministry? Yeah, um, I think I've learned the, that it's extremely important um, and you know, as Stu mentioned, you know, where we live, we tend to, you know, uh, the young people tend to hang out with young people, families hang out with families, oldies hang out with oldies, that sort of thing. But um, what we, what we, you know, what our friends up at um, Warren and, and at Fingal and all around uh, ha- have shown us is that the, all generations are equally important for teaching and encouraging one another. Mm-hmm. Um I think, you know, I, as Stu's talking about the, the river conventions and so forth, I remember every time we left 
Nan Peters would be in tears because she didn't want it to finish mm. because she just loved the fact that we were all together mm. encouraging one another, no matter who we were, no matter how old we were. Um, we were there loving Jesus together and sharing the gospel with one another. Mm. And I think um, that's one of the, the, the things I think we've learned is that young, old, anywhere in between, we've all got something that we can share with one another to encourage one another. Um, the young young people are not there just to be seen and not heard. The old people are not fuddy duddies that are to go and sit in the corner. We've all got something that we can share with one another to um, help each other on this journey of faith that we're on. Um, because it's it is it's a long it's a marathon. It's not a sprint, and we need that encouragement daily. Mm. And so the fact that there are um, there are saints that are, have sort of gone before us and 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 experienced life and what it is to live as a Christian for a long time has so much they can share with the generation who are just starting out. Those who are just starting out have a, 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 um, an enthusiasm and a vibrance about their, um, about their faith that sometimes can re-energise those who have been going for a long time. You know, those sorts of things, I think, were things that, really, um, that I really learnt uh, from our friends out there, yeah. Would you say some of the things, Stu, that we learnt from our Aboriginal brothers and sisters um, were perhaps a, a quite a strong argument against the homogeneous unit principle? Yeah, well, I think, I think the homogeneous unit principle is focusing on the idea that uh, our society is made up of different groups of people who are like each other, different homogeneous units. So in the Solon Shire, we've already talked about that there are surfers and that some people go on mi- ministry to those people who were surfers. Uh, last week, Leonie talked about uh, chaplaincy, sports chaplaincy, how there's a, sp- a sporting community within our mm. culture and that homogeneous unit, it's, you know, people design ministries for that. Uh, but what's occurred to me is that uh, there's often in the homogeneous unit principle, it's about embracing sameness, that you minister to people who are like you. And I think what I learned from Nan Peters is that we, we, we come from completely different places um i mean I, I remember going to nan's funeral and it was a very moving day because there was about 400 people and there was even representatives from the government that were there because nan was the last um person who remembered new south wales before white people came yeah. so she was living traditionally and she was the last um aboriginal lady who remembers uh, living traditionally on the riverbank singing their songs to telling their stories, speaking their language, and all that was taken from them. And so it was quite a seismic event when she died. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what I remember from Nan was that she'd met Jesus and that that the love that that lady had and the leadership that she had and her willingness to not only lead her own people and love her own people, but to adopt us as well and to lead us as well. And she became one of our leaders. She became one of our um, aunties and she became one of our... Um, elders and we were so um, embraced by her even though we were different and um, you know our people had done so much damage to her people and her family and her life yet because she loved Jesus so much she's reconciled to us she embraced us and taught us how to love people who were different and I think that's how I, I best suppose I can explain how I feel so excited about intergenerational ministry because it's about yes it's not a bad thing to embrace sameness as we have had people on the podcast that do that really well Mm. but i think it's exciting to embrace people who are different in the name of jesus and i think that brings glory to god because when people see nan peters and and me sitting at a table in, in dubbo at a river convention and have a giggle as they walk past these two friends having a good laugh and talking to each other and they can see how how unusual that is to see that and i remember one day i was sitting on the riverbank with my brother ike and and you know this big flock of black cockatoos flew over the top of us and we both just looked at each other and just went how good is god Mm. that he's just given us the gift of those black cockatoos flying over the top and he made those cockatoos he made us and he made us to be um loving each other and i think i think that um what i'm hoping is that more people in the city of Sydney will actually look around and go, hey, it doesn't matter if we're different. We can actually be all Christians together. And in a world where everyone tends to hang out in homogeneous units, they might start asking, what is what is is it with these Christians? Because they're so 
they've got so many different um, groups coming together. What is it about them? And the answer is Jesus. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Sorry, I was just reflecting on that. It was a really, really cool way, I think, to wrap it up. <laughs> Thanks mm. very much, you. Thank you very much, too, Joe. I really appreciate your time yeah. and your reflections. So um, I really enjoyed this episode. So thank yeah. you very much for all your stories. Um, Thanks for having me. Uh, guys, if you are listening, uh, you can um, get in touch with us in via our Discord, which will be the link in the show notes. You can also email me at joel at shockabsorber.com.au if you have any questions. Uh, the other thing to remind you is that the Shock Absorber Conference is coming up at the end of this month on the 30th of October. You can register on the Shock Absorber website, which is just shockabsorber.com.au. Um, for now, but I think we're going to wrap it up. So thank you very much to these guys. Thank you for listening, with a, and we'll finish with a one-way. One way.